This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Strozinski. On today's show, three major AEW stars on the shelf and for a while. This WWE star sticking around and WWE making some cuts and this expected name maybe on the floor, as well as a bunch of other news and notes that we'll have to get into. We've got some stuff to talk about with AEW. We've got some stuff to talk about with WWE. And we've got backlash taking place later on this afternoon, helping me break it all down and sort it all out. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? My man, who knew France loved professional wrestling like that they took over smackdown and they took over a segment that was supposed to feature some aggression between cody rhodes and aj styles and they made it their own it was spectacular it was a little confusing at first because they were triggered by a word but once you got online and figured out they were triggered by phenomenal which made them all excited it was special i've watched it like 15 times it's amazing to see and now today it's a dream match i can't wait to see it former Bullet Club members, and Cody referenced it, Cody Rhodes, AJ Styles. Look, it sucks because nobody believes that AJ Styles is going to win. But outside of that, knowing the outcome, I can't wait to see the match because it could be match of the year candidate. Yeah, the crowd was super hot on Friday night, like super, super hot. And it was pretty special. Uh, I thought it was amazing. From the moment that that show kicked off to the moment that that show closed, that crowd didn't sit down, and that crowd did not stop cheering. Uh, our opening match was Bailey uh, mixed in with Bianca Belair and uh, Jade Cargill. Uh, you also had Naomi on their team taking on Damage Control and uh, Tiffany Stratton. Uh, it was a, a, a an interesting match, and the crowd was super hyped for Bailey sitting there chanting for Bailey the way Bailey used to get chanted for when she was in NXT which was special. It was a moment. Bailey recognized it. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I, I Look, I thought the way the crowd interacted with these wrestlers on this show was awesome, and I think it really helped set up what we're going to get with this pay-per-view. I uh, thought it was really, really nice. And, and look, going back to something that you said, because I think it leads right into the predictions, I, I think nobody believes AJ Styles is winning this match. Nobody believes that he's beating Cody Rhodes. But when you look at what took place after night two of the WWE draft, which took place on on Monday night, I'm not sure if there's really anybody right now who's in line to really challenge Cody Rhodes. And if you look at what took place with those draft picks, you had uh, Gunther and Ludwig Kaiser going to Raw. SmackDown ended up taking Jade, Jade Cargill. Raw ended up taking the remainder of damage control. SmackDown ended up taking Kevin Owens. So maybe Kevin Owens, if you get a heel turn, could challenge uh, Cody Rhodes. CM Punk stays on Raw, which makes sense because he's going to be feuding with Drew McIntyre. Bobby Lashley, Montez Ford, Angela Dawkins, and B-Fab stay on SmackDown. Braun Strowman comes back, goes to Raw. Tiffany Stratton stays on on SmackDown. Uh, You have Rey Mysterio in, in, in LWO staying on or moving to raw Santos Escobar uh, in, in his crew, Legado del Fantasmo end up staying on SmackDown, which is nice because you get those guys broken up again. Drew McIntyre finally gets selected and goes to raw Nakamura goes to SmackDown. So you might be able to rekindle some of that for, for Cody Rhodes, but I think we're all kind of over it. And then Finn Balor and, and the rest of judgment day, except for, Except I say, except for uh, Rhea Ripley gets moved to Raw. SmackDown gets Naomi. Raw gets Ilya Dragunov. SmackDown gets Chelsea Green and Piper Niven. And then you go through, you got Raw and Xavier Woods going to SmackDown. Uh, Elton Prince and Kit Wilson. And then Laya Valkyria goes to Raw. SmackDown gets Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. And we just kind of keep working our way through. And, and look, there's really no name 
that really sticks out as a major challenge for Cody Rhodes. So I think going through this process, I'm not sure who's going to even challenge Cody Rhodes in the near future. I don't know who's going to challenge Cody Rhodes on SmackDown. To me, I feel like they've kind of done themselves a bit of a disservice with this draft. They've moved a lot of power off of SmackDown and moved it onto Raw. And it really feels like you've left Cody Rhodes to man the ship and to to run the ship without a legit challenger. The thing that made Cody's run so special, made Roman Reigns' run so special, is at certain points you felt like you had some le- you felt like you had a legitimate chance of somebody taking that belt off of Roman, and, and that was what made Cody's run so special. Whether he was on Raw or on SmackDown, he was always in that circle to challenge for that belt. Right now, I think WWE has painted themselves into a bit of a corner without having a legitimate challenger for Cody Rhodes. What do you think SmackDown is going to do without having that legitimate challenger for Cody Rhodes? Yeah, it's crazy, right? It's at, You laid it out perfectly. So the best way to book it later on today is, yeah, AJ Styles takes the loss, but you got to have Gallows and Anderson whoop the shit out of Cody, and you got to keep this feud going a little bit. You can carry this feud over into SummerSlam before maybe you you establish somebody else that wants the title. Clearly, on the other side, Jey Uso is super popular now. Um, maybe you, you cross over a little bit there. Gunther, as well, is a world title contender, but he's on Raw. So absolutely, you are right that currently in, in WWE, they don't have enough main event talent on SmackDown, and they don't have enough main event heat in terms of heels. Jey Uso, the, the bloodline, but it seems like now they're more into the Civil War. So you are absolutely right. Um, I think that currently this feud with AJ Styles was kind of put together quickly, but it has the chance to have more yeah. layers if you tell the right story. And Cody opened the subject with saying too sweet, and then AJ slapped him. I think he takes the loss, and then you bring back Gallows and Anderson, and you just have AJ Styles act more like a heel because it was tough for him to represent a heel when the crowd was chanting and, and making it a party scene. I think the AJ Styles and, and Cody Rhodes were taken aback a little bit, like um, they're chanting the, the shit out of the stuff that we're supposed to get heat on. But there were some things like the slap, and things that were said that got a little bit of heat. So we'll see how this plays out going forward. But you're right. In the current present moment, uh, Cody Rhodes and the prospects of his feuds don't seem as appealing right now, but they got some months to establish some heels and those that want an opportunity at um, at a title. So it stinks, too, because you, you could think, too, that Gunther, Drew McIntyre, if they moved over to SmackDown, might have been a little bit better because Nakamura... Right now, the the biggest thing is that nobody that could face Cody is a legitimate threat where you go, well, maybe he deserves it. Currently, nobody at the moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and look, I think what you brought up there, too, is, is something that, that I think we need to talk about a little bit. So this crowd, super white hot. We've talked about that already. And we talked about how special that that crowd really made uh, SmackDown feel. And look, I think they're going to make this pay-per-view Ooh. feel amazing. But – you had two guys in that ring who had a job to do. They had to sell this angle. And this is a very quick angle that we're getting into. Not a lot of time to really build towards it. So they had to sell this. They had to to work around the crowd doing what the crowd was doing. And look, I thought they did a pretty good job. There was a point where you had Cody who normally wants to lean in and, and go with the crowd and kind of give the crowd their moments. Cody was on a schedule. Cody was at the end of the program and was like, look, we got to get all this stuff in. So as the crowd was chanting, he started talking over the crowd, which is something he doesn't normally do. Uh, You had AJ Styles, who I think was a little taken aback by the reaction that he got, was a little taken aback by what the crowd was doing with him and was still able to to go from heel at like a seven and amp it up to like heel at a nine and be able to get what he had to get in. I think these two guys really did a fantastic job navigating this hot crowd, navigating what they had to do, and really navigating what they had to sell to really get us to this pay-per-view. And again, remember, there's not a lot of history here. There's not a lot for you to go off of. And I think Cody tried to work some of that history in, whether it was you know, being from Georgia, watching AJ Styles kind of come up, or, or being parts of the Bullet Club at different times. 
I, I think they've tried to layer in some of that history, but there's really not anything substantial. And yet they were able to navigate this hot crowd and deliver to get you to this point. So I, I think what they were able to do was, was pretty fantastic. What did you think about the job that they were able to do to kind of build this very short story to get us to this point? Yeah, no doubt. And I think sometimes feuds, when you have two great wrestlers, you don't really need to build up a lot. I mean, you could have maybe made the Bullet Club reference on television. It's fine that they didn't, but clearly there's a history. We all know that, you know, the smart marks know uh, AJ Styles was an early founder, early member of the Bullet Club, and then Cody Rhodes in his run and the indie scene became a member too as well. So there's a history there. And it, it's cool, too, because Tama Tonga is now in WWE, but but he's now in a, in a different angle. So, look, it's just a match that people want to see. And I think Cody set the tone perfectly where he said, look, maybe the commentators can call this a dream match. And AJ Styles indicated, look, I'm a serious contender and I want to get back to being phenomenal. It was just great that the trigger word for the French crowd was actually phenomenal. And the, if you want to go online, you can see what that chant was about. Just go on Twitter, type in SmackDown chant. Everybody that's French was given the explanation about what the hell was going on because it made no sense. Like they just broke out into a chant after a word. I was like, uh, did I miss something? But it was really cool to learn about. And then when you go back and enjoy it, it really set the scene with the way the camera angle went and panned the crowd and the way in which the, the performers were forced to get to their point. So look, perfect. Uh, AJ Styles was the heel. He slapped Cody Rhodes. And now we get this match, which by all accounts should deliver when you recognize that, hey, there are some individuals in WWE that are pure wrestlers. AJ Styles, Cody Rhodes is a dream match, and I think people are going to talk about it for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic match. And uh, if you're ready, let's just get right to the predictions. Uh, backlash taking place at, uh, I believe it's 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here in the U.S. Uh, SmackDown was taped uh, way earlier. Uh, it was like eight hours ahead of time before, uh, before we actually got it here in the U.S. Uh, so... Kicking off with the WWE Women's Tag Team Championship, we've got the Kabuki Warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane, defending their titles against Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill. And look, Bianca has lots of heat with damage control. They really leaned into her not trusting Bayley on SmackDown. That looks like that could pay some dividends later on down the road. Um, but right now, Bianca, Jade, uh, Bianca not trusting at all with uh, with Bailey being in an inner circle uh, with Jade Cargill, uh, Kabuki Warriors defending their belts. Who do you have winning this match? Man, it's tough, right? Because it's a PLE, but the Kabuki Warriors just got the belt. Do you just start switching it up? I, I just think that when you see, look, I mean, here's the crazy part about this card. A lot of the predictions just kind of would indicate that there's going to be a status quo. But I feel like for storyline purposes, Jade and Bianca need to be title holders. And I think they're going to dominate. And I think that you recognize that what purpose would it be for Bianca and, and Jade to lose? I think they, they would look really good with, with, with titles around their waist. So I, I think that the titles change hands. Yeah, I think going into this, I think uh, Bianca and Jade come out the new champions. Um, I, I think you're looking to develop and you're looking to really boost Jade Cargill's uh, presence. So it only makes sense to me for Jade to come away with a belt here. Um, it allows you also to do a little something with Bianca Belair. Uh, so I've got Bianca and Jade winning this as well. Uh, Randy Orton and Kevin Owens versus the bloodline, Solo Sokoa and Tama Tonga. How do you see this one playing out? There's a lot of heat in this. Uh, these guys have been going back and forth. I do like the, the, uh, the, the RKO, the new version of RKO, um, and kind of what that stands for with Randy and Kevin Owens. Um, I thought it was kind of fast, fa fantastic to have the show um, RKO. I thought that was pretty great. But Bloodline, this new version of the Bloodline, incredibly hot right now. This is Tomatonga's first match that we'll get. Who do you see winning this? Yeah, I see it going two ways. But in terms of what's best for business, what's best for business is the Bloodline to start to establish some dominance with Solo Sokoa. So they have to win. But I could also see. So my prediction is that Solo and Tamatanga are going to be dominant. They're going to win, and they'll handle business. But I also could see that Randy, you know, and uh, Kevin get the win, but by disqualification, where the the, the Bloodline uh, has a debuting member. Or, or I think that you know what, I'm going to 
you know, remove any doubt that I win. I think there's going to be a new debut of a member that, that comes and helps out the bloodline established dominance. But they could write it in a way where, you know, uh, Kevin and Randy get uh, the win by disqualification. But the, the badasses are the bloodline who end up being dominant. But I need the one, two, three. Solo has to win it. He's got to be dominant. He's, if, you, if you don't, you basically derailed the push right from the beginning and it doesn't have any credibility. So you need to have them have dominance. So I look forward to seeing how they get it. Yeah, I've got uh, Solisco and Tom, Tom and Tango winning this. Um, no doubts in my mind. It, it, look, it, I, as much as, as Randy Orton and Kevin Owens could win this, uh, I've got the bloodline winning this. I, I think this might be where you insert uh, said new member, Jacob Fatu, into this, uh, into this new story. Um, this could be the spot where you bring him in and, and really help debut him and then kind of launch whatever version of the bloodline this is going to be. Uh, you heard on Friday Night SmackDown, you heard uh, Paul Heyman kind of being at a bit of a crossroads here where he's trying to, to take care of Roman Reigns and take care of the, the former uh, bloodline leader. Uh, and you've got the new bloodline with Solo Sokoa taking charge and running roughshod and doing what he's doing. Uh, he's trying to walk this fine line. This could be where Solo incorporates a new member, and that new member would be Jacob Fatu, uh, the brother of Jimmy and Jay. Um, so I think we, we're both in lockstep there. Next, we've got the Women's Women's Championship. Uh, we've got Bailey defending against Naomi and Tiffany Stratton. I've got Bailey winning this. She just won the belt. Unless there's an injury that we don't know about, I don't know why you would have Tiffany Stratton come out the winner. I, I think Tiffany Stratton's going to be fantastic. And I think in due time, she'll be a champion. Um, I think Naomi being inserted into this match is more for storyline purposes. I think Bailey retains her belt and is the winner here. No doubt about it. Bailey, bet the house on it if you're allowed to bet on it. <laughs> All right. Next, we've got the World Heavyweight Championship. We've got Damian Priest defending against Jay Uso. Um, as much as I'm a huge fan of Jay Uso, I don't see him winning here. I don't see him beating Damian Priest. I don't see him unthroning Damian Priest, who just got his belt. Uh, I think Damian Priest retains his belt here. Uh, I think Jey Uso puts up a hell of a fight, though. But I've got Damian Priest walking away the winner. Yeah, it's clear. Um, this is another situation in which most people going into this match just want to see the crazy entrance. The dark. I think uh, Jey Uso was involved in a dark match on SmackDown, so make sure you check that out. The crowd went apeshit doing the dance celebration. And again, on pay-per-view, it's going to look sweet when Jey Uso comes out. That's really going to be the gist of what you expect. And then now, for me... I just kind of want to now start to see how Damian Priest establishes himself, establishes dominance. How does he? Because look, you know how he rolls with the bloodline. You know that he's the leader that he's trying to establish. You know, uh, the quirkiness that they had on Raw with uh, uh, J.D. McDonough. I thought it was cool with uh, uh, having P Patrick Mahomes there, kind of getting into it with Logan Paul. I thought that was kind of funny. But to me, that kind of quirkiness where the angle where he's trying to rein in the 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 judgment day is beneath him. Damian Priest is a killer. He needs to go out there, assert his dominance, and when it comes time to finish, he's got to establish himself as being the guy. And I think that this match has the chance where now you start to see the wrestler because you've seen the leader, you've seen the role, the back and forth with Rhea, the constant annoyance that he has with the, the judgment day. But now Damian Priest has to emerge as the guy in the ring against opponents and I want to see how uh, that match looks because Jey Uso's last match in a big moment didn't deliver so I don't want this to be a super kick power bomb party let's have a match tell a story and Damian Priest is going to win yeah give these guys some time and let them kind of create something let them both show out because they both can wrestle their ass off uh, speaking of wrestling your ass off uh, these two guys working for the WWE championship Cody Rhodes defending against AJ Styles uh, look, I think we both believe Cody Rhodes is coming away the winner. I think AJ puts on a great show. I think you get something fantastic here. This could be the first story in a set of trilogy of stories. But as of right now, I don't see AJ Styles coming away the winner. I don't see him coming away the victor here. I think Cody Rhodes wins this and, and kind of rides off to whatever that next story is going to be. I've got Cody Rhodes winning. I believe you have Cody Rhodes winning as well. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, with the, you, the shortest reign in the history of the company in front of France, uh, there's no doubt about it. But see, now look, 
just on, on a quick note with AEW, do you see the way when, when Swerve Strickland opens the show with the belt around his waist, it looks so much better. Every time Cody puts the belt around his waist in the promo, there's a promo that he did after the show just thanking the French crowd and, and telling them to keep bringing it. He looks good. He just needs to, okay, I know he's a suit guy, but he needs to just put the belt on and walk out. Because again, he, he, he brought it out and it looks stupid. Just the way the belt is designed around his shoulder is bigger than his shoulder. It looks stupid. And then when he wears it around his waist, he looks like a legit champion. So he either has Because it's to, a silly belt. That's a stupid looking belt. Yeah, that's why. He has to unstrap it because when it looks like that, that's how that's literally how I carry the belt. And that's how my nephews carry it when when we, we fuck around, is they put it around their shoulder, it looks like it's sticking out in all it doesn't look right. Swerve was perfect. He comes out, the guy, Nani dances, he has the belt with the coat around it, he looks like a legit badass. So Cody's got to stop fucking around, he's got to look the part. So I know the suits are cool, he does his promos in it, but wear the fucking belt around your waist. And 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 because it, it, every time he tries to carry it, it, it looks dumb. It doesn't look right as a champion. He gets worked up over the silliest stuff. Like, I am worked up. I don't even like, I don't even pay attention to that. Like Cody looks the part. The guy wears no, a suit to the ring and he looks like a million bucks. But he's got a belt. He's got, he's a champion now. And now he has to carry it and he's got to either hold it. You, you can't strap that belt and just look at it. If you just pay attention to it, when you see it, he's actually carrying it the way a fan would carry it. It, 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 it looks like a fanboy is just in the ring with a belt. He's got to look like the champion, and sometimes the way your—I don't know—the way their body is versus the way the the big the belt is that big. He just cannot. He cannot strap the belt and put it over his shoulder. He cannot. Cl- it just doesn't look right. So this match, I just want to see go half an hour. Um, look, and 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 I hope this conversation's happening. I hope it does. I hope the conversation is backstage. They sit down. They're they're bullshitting, and the producer comes up and is like, "Look, boys." Osprey and Danielson, I think probably could outdo you guys. So go out there and prove me wrong. And I hope they get that challenge to say, hey, just a couple weeks ago, there was a pay-per-view match that the whole world is talking about. Go out there and top it. And I think AJ Styles and Cody want to do it and they can do it. I mean, literally it's lineage, two great wrestlers. There's no way in which my mind, I feel like this match will under deliver, but I want to see uh, a Styles clash off the top rope. I want to see all the moves. I want to see uh, maybe some references to the Bullet Club, something that's really cool that establishes this match. And and to me, what's going to be special is this crowd might do that back down chant again. Um, I, I can't wait to see it. I, I I'm excited to see how the match turns out, what it ends up being. But yeah, there's no there, there's no scenario in which AJ St- he's not. I mean, he's taken so many L's. There's no scenario in which he comes away with the title. But the goal should also be have a great match. Cody wins, but AJ's got to go uh, another step nuclear. Uh, AJ Styles has to go another step nuclear in his heel persona moving forward. If this is indeed his final run, you got to build him up as the badass heel that's fucking around with Cody saying, hey, you know, uh, really taking the heat that he said, hey, I'm pissed off that the way that you are being treated versus me. That's a good start, but they got to take it to another level. They got to add more layers to it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fantastic match, and I think they get every bit of a half an hour to to tell this story. It should be great. Uh, recounting the card, we both have uh, Bianca and Jade coming away as the new WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. Uh, we both have Solo and Tamatanga beating Randy Orton and Kevin Owens, possibly a new addition to the bloodline with J- Jacob Fatu. Uh, the WWE Women's Champion, uh, Bailey retains over Naomi and Tiffany Stratton. We both have Damian Priest defending against Jey Uso and coming away the victor. And we both have Cody Rhodes defeating AJ Styles to remain WWE champion. Uh, so, look, it, this should be a, a, a good card. It should be a short card. Everybody should get their time. This is generally just kind of a throwaway pay-per-view. Right, and this right. is coming off very quickly off of WrestleMania. So you don't have a lot of time to build a lot of stories. You don't have a lot of time to really get people involved. Um, this should be, should be a good one though. Triple H has, has basically taken these throwaway pay-per-views and made them be must see. So it should be fantastic. Uh, let's get into some AEW conversations. Um, a couple weeks we've been bagging on AEW and, and look, I watch AEW now and I look for positives. I look for anything good. Um, there's, there's still some warts with AEW, uh, but I'm finding some positives, and some of those positives I found are we're getting some longer-term storytelling, right? And you can see that um, as far as 
uh, Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta. This story has been being told for a while where Trent's kind of looked at Orange Cassidy like, what the hell? Um, we've had some issues going on with Chuck Taylor. Chuck Taylor hasn't wrestled in a while. Uh, he's dealing with some medical issues. There was some a time where Chuck Taylor was getting paid by appearance by AEW, didn't really have a contract. And now you're getting uh, Trent Beretta worked into the storyline with Orange Cassidy, and this has been going on, like I said, for a while. So it's a, a glimpse into some long-term story building, which I'm going to take as a positive. You have stuff going on with the elite. Uh, this is some longer-term storytelling. This is some longer-term booking. Uh, you're working around a Kenny Omega injury, who Kenny Omega came back, and you're, you're, you're telling some longer-term story arcs, which are good. Now, you're still having your short-term story arcs, um, and, and look, you're, you're getting Christian as the challenger to swerve and they were, they were scratching and clawing at some history to kind of tell a bit of a story here to be able to build towards their next pay-per-view. I like that. I think that's smart. Um, it's a good way to work a new challenger in for swerve and be able to kind of lean on, on something from the past to tell a bit of a story and lay a foundation. So you're seeing some decent storytelling tropes here i like that i think it's good um it's it's a good way to to work into what you're doing um it's a lot better than just kind of throwing these matches on you're giving a bit of substance as to why these matches are taking place and i'm going to roll with the positives for aew now kenny omega did return uh we ended up getting what was realistically a three-hour dynamite um, they were able to roll Dynamite and Rampage in together because Rampage got bumped because of the NBA playoffs. Uh, you had Kenny Omega basically come out just before Rampage started, just at the very end of Dynamite, and it rolled into the very beginning segment of of Rampage where Kenny Omega comes out, cuts a promo. Uh, Okada comes out, stands across from him, and Okada, or Omega says, look, you're ready to renew this rivalry. You're ready to redo this again. And next thing you know, the elite attack him. Uh, Kenny Omega basically says he's got diverticulitis and any blow to the abdomen could be his last blow, could make him uh, live the rest of his life with a colostomy bag on. Uh, Jack Perry comes out, hits him in the midsection with a chair. They go to stretcher him out. They flip the stretcher over uh, before he even gets to the ambulance. Uh, FTR comes out to try to make that save. FTR gets dismantled by the elite. So the elite taking out Kenny Omega, taking out FTR, what were your thoughts on a returning Kenny Omega who came back to Winnipeg and then just gets annihilated by different parts of the elite? It was awesome. I thought it was, okay, intriguing. And it definitely built up to when he gets attacked, you're like, oh. And I thought it was really cool to see Okada come down. It brings back old memories of their feud. And um, uh, look, Jack Perry, whatever you may think of him, the way in which he's been brought back has been interesting. And has made him relevant. Been fantastic. Yes, has been made. It made him relevant and, and believable as a strong heel. So that is something that now is a reset moving forward. I thought the intro was funny, where you have the uh, the EVPs just have the all, just highlights of themselves in the intro. So it, it was a, a decent dynamite. It didn't lag too much, and I do agree with you in a lot of aspects that they're starting to reset and and get some some use out of the star power that they have. And they're now uh, obviously clearly responding to the fact that people have said you're not telling stories. And now they are. They have some pieces in place so that they can tell some stories that people can be interested in. Kenny Omega coming back, very interesting. And the way that he sold it, it, it was believable. Like, oh, oh shit, like at any moment I could get hurt in this ring. And, and to see him out there was really cool. The Winnipeg crowd was great. They were into it most of the night. And the matches delivered. They did. They did put on a, a very decent dynamite in response to some of the critics as of late. And now we get to see some angles that hopefully have some payoffs that are are lasting and and have some meaning and resonance. Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, the, the 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 moment on on Wednesday night was really Kenny Omega coming back. Um, I thought for a show, it was a good show. You got you got a little bit of story movement. Uh, with different things going on. Uh, I didn't really think it was a, a monumental show. But when I looked at Dynamite compared to what I got for Raw and what I got for SmackDown, because I kind of felt like Raw and SmackDown, Raw was more just kind of a filler for the draft. It was just kind of a placeholder show. We're just trying to get to Friday night 
because after Friday night, we've got a, a pay-per-view. And, and to me, it really felt like SmackDown was kind of the appetizer for this pay-per-view. Uh, you had, a, you had a, a tag team championship match. You had uh, a couple multi-woman matches. And it was just kind of, okay, we just got to get through to Saturday. So to me, it really felt like Raw and SmackDown this week with WWE specifically was replace older shows. They were just trying to get you to uh, this Saturday pay-per-view. Um, while it felt like Dynamite kind of gave you a little bit more, um, it really helped usher in uh, this new wave of stories that we're telling with with wrestling on AEW. Um, helped usher in uh, returning Kenny Omega. Helped usher in and really draw the the the, the battle lines for the elite um, with with whether it's Kenny Omega, whether it's Tony Khan, whether it's anybody who wants to oppose the elite right now. Uh, so for me, I want to give my point for show of the week to Dynamite. I was wondering what was your show of the week this week? Oh no no no! Oh, France lived up. You can't give it to Dynamite. Um, in my opinion, it's a fair opinion to say, hey, that they did better compared to what they have been doing, but. All in all, when you see the way the crowd interacted with everything, you see the street. We didn't even talk about the street profits that just went into the crowd and had a nice moment. Uh, you saw a developing feud with Bobby Lashley and the young guy now from NXT. You're like, whoa! Yeah, Carmelo Hayes, and Bobby yeah. Lashley should be interesting. Very. That inter- was that was a nice little touch. Very subtle, but subtle, very nice. Subtle and nice planting of the seed. I thought that uh, the tag match was great as well. Um, New Catch Republic establishing themselves, you know, hey, gaining traction little by little in the tag team. And then to me, which was I thought was really cool, um, Theory and Grayson Waller with their it smells like cheese in here was really funny. I laughed and I was like, I was like, okay. And then they go out there and handle business. So just with the special moments that were created, I think to me, you got to give the point to SmackDown. All right. Uh, you ready for some news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? Some major AEW stars are on the shelf and for a while. Last week in the John Moxley Powerhouse Hobbs match, the ending kind of came out of nowhere and it was speculated that Hobbs had been hurt. Early this week, Fightful Select followed up on a Brian Alvarez of Wrestling Observer's initial report by confirming the injury did occur, adding that Hobbs is not expected to be back in action in any time soon. As a result, it was detailed in Alvarez's report that the match between Hobbs and Moxley on Dynamite was originally set to go longer, and then it ended up being. However, when Hobbs injured his knee, the finish was pushed forward, and Moxley secured the win via a rear naked choke. The injury to Hobbs' knee is reported to be significant. In another report, AEW confirmed that Julia Hart is injured and will need surgery to repair it. Uh, the report did not specify what the injury was, just that the injury uh, that, that surgery was needed and that she would be away from action for a while. Uh, Hart ended up posting on uh, Instagram uh, that she was hurt. It looks like it is an arm, possibly a shoulder injury. Again, no specifics really given for the injury. Uh, and then uh, Darby Allen, obviously out with a broken foot, uh, was hit by a bus. Um, there was a picture that was posted uh, that had him looking incredibly rough. Uh, looks like he just had a broken nose uh, to add to that broken foot, but was hit by a bus in New York City. Now, this WWE star is sticking around. Uh, After over a year of reports regarding Drew McIntyre's expiring deal, it was finally confirmed that the Scottish Warrior had re-signed with the company. According to Dave Meltzer, McIntyre's new deal is for three years, with a 2027 now the year of the expiration. Uh, Fightful Select had reported that McIntyre's contract was worth big money, with the Scotsman said to be happy with the outcome after a lot of back and forth in negotiations with WWE. WWE could have a new wrestling or we could have a new wrestling promotion starting up. On May 1st, PW Insider reported that it looks like Scott D'Amour may be set to launch a new pro wrestling promotion. In April, a trademark was filed for Maple Leaf Wrestling, with it being listed for the same corporate address as D'Amour's Border City Wrestling promotion. Maple Leaf Wrestling was the terminology used to describe the promotion, to describe a promotion's run in Toronto by the Tunney family in the 1970s and 1980s as the promotion ran the Maple Leaf Garden. In February of 2024, Anthem Entertainment announced that they had let TNA President Scott D'Amour 
go and replaced him with Anthony Sissione. Many fans have wondered what Diamore's next move in wrestling would be after the shocking nature of his TNA departure. This looks like it could be it. Uh, Diamore had a great relationship with many wrestlers that have come through TNA, with some leaving after TNA, leaving TNA after his firing and others protesting the firing. I believe money and financial backing would be the biggest hurdle uh, for this potential startup to be successful. If Diamore can somehow secure finances, this could be a legit contender to WWE and AEW. Uh, this AEW star is no longer with the company. According to Fightful Select, Ethan Page is no longer with AEW or ROH, with insiders suggesting that to be the case right now or his departure is a formality. Uh, Page is no longer listed on the AEW roster page, with it also indicating that he is done with the company. Fightful Select also reported that Page was looking to leave AEW as far back as February, having signed a three-year contract back in March of 2021. His last appearance was back in December of 2023 on Collision, where he lost to Kenny Omega. And more releases, this time from the WWE. Uh, it's this time NXT is cutting ties with several talent. This took place on Friday. PW Insider reported that the following 10 names have been let go. Uh, Ezekiel Balgan, uh, Julian Baldi, Terry Bear here, Bear Hill, uh, Emma Diaz, Valencia, uh, Furzo, Kershaw, LaFleur, Darrell Mason, Vlad, uh, Polenkovac, uh, Kaya Saint, and no surprise here, Drew McIntyre. Of those names, in addition to McIntyre, Furzo, Bear Hill, and Saint had appeared on screen with matches with Furzo, having been with WWE NXT since 2019. Gulak has basically been on the bench since Ronda Rousey's accusations came out a couple of weeks ago. It just kind of felt like it was a formality before Gulak got released. He was basically written off of TV. So... That is not necessarily a huge surprise. It just kind of is finally everything is catching up. The other shoe has dropped for Drew Gulak. It'll be interesting to see what ha happens with him. Um, that Ronda Rousey report kind of came out of nowhere. And in my estimation, it didn't really seem all that inflammatory. It seemed to be much to do about nothing. But it is what it is. It's bad publicity. So WWE just kind of cut ties. Uh, that's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Yes, and now we can officially report it's making its way around the internet that Seth Rollins also signed a multi-year deal for big money. It's making its way around the internet. Most people believed it, so there was never going to be a doubt that Seth Rollins, one of the great wrestling minds and wrestler, wrestling performers in the company, it was going to stay with WWE. Now he's on the mend, and let's see when he comes back. As well, we should highlight that in the midst of the chaos there is something now we got to plant the seed that when Roman Reigns does come back, I think he's got to come back as the face. I think he's going to be the biggest face in the company. The crowds are chanting, we want Roman. The crowds are missing the tribal chief, and I think they're ready to shower him with praise for the run that he had, the appreciation that they want to show for a great performer. So let's just wait and see how the bloodline angle plays out, because most likely people believe it's going to be Solo versus Roman, and they're going to take it in the direction of a few to establish dominance of the bloodline. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc, John Macaroon. Make sure to follow us on social media at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow us at the network at Detroit Podcast. We'll be watching along with uh, everybody else at one o'clock for Backlash. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be probably uh, a predictable pay per view, but. Some of the most predictable pay-per-views, or PLEs as they're calling it, are the ones that are most rewarding because while we know the outcome, we can see what the quality of matches and reactions and the crazy shit scene that's going to be all over the place with the French crowd that maybe wants to get more PLEs. So let's see what happens. It's going to be fun, and we will be back next week to recap it all on the next edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.